Hi everyone, welcome to the ADA webinar entitled Exercise Against Anxiety and Depression. I'm Demet Cech, a doctoral student in clinical psychology at the University of Miami, and I'm a member of the ADAA Public Education Committee. You should be listening to this through your computer speakers. Do not need a, you do not need a telephone connection. If you've dialed in, please hang up and turn up your computer speakers. We'll be able to answer some of your questions at the end of the presentation. On the right side of your screen, you should see a Q&A panel. There's a little field at the bottom of that panel, and when you click in it, you can type in a question. Then either hit your Enter key or click the icon. You can ask questions at any time, and we'll try to get to as many as possible. Other participants cannot see your questions. We may not have time to get to your individual questions, so we apologize if that is the case. We'll also be recording this webinar to make it available on the ADA website at a later date. Now, before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to tell you a little bit about ADAA. It was started in 1979, and today it's the leading nonprofit dedicated to increasing awareness and education about anxiety disorders, depression, OCD, PTSD, and related illnesses. ADAA's mission is to improve diagnosis and promote the prevention, treatment, and cure of these disorders through education, practice, and research. ADAA fights to end stigma by promoting the message that they're real, serious, and treatable. Please visit the ADAA website, that's www.adaa.org, which includes Find a Therapist, a searchable database of treatment providers, as well as free educational information and resources, self-test, self-help groups, clinical trials, and a lot more. You can support ADAA's efforts, such as this webinar series, by making a charitable contribution on the ADAA website. Now, before for, um, further ado, now let me introduce the speaker, and today we'll be hearing from Dr. Michael Otto. Dr. Otto is a professor of psychological and brain sciences at Boston University. His primary research interests lie in the cognitive behavioral treatment of anxiety, mood, and substance use disorders, with an emphasis on the validation of novel strategies to improve mental health. His focus on hard-to-treat conditions and principles underlying behavior change failures has led to an additional focus on health behavior promotion, including investigations of medication adherence, sleep, smoking, and exercise. Dr. Otto has been identified as a top producer in the clinical empirical literature. He is the author of the 2011 books, Exercise for Mood and Anxiety, Proven Strategies for Overcoming Depression and Enhancing Well-Being, and 10-Minute CBT, Integrating Cognitive Behavioral Strategies into Your Practice with Oxford University Press. Dr. Otto has authored over 370 articles, including step-by-step -step treatment manuals for bipolar disorder, social anxiety disorder, and panic disorder. Dr. Otto's research has received support from the National Institute of Mental Health and the National Institute of Drug Abuse. He serves on the Scientific Council of ADAA. Remember, you can type in a question at any time. Now let me turn it over to Dr. Otto. Thank you very much. <clears throat> all right, all. I'm very happy to be with you remotely. Also, I have a little bit of a cold that's been going around, so I may mute myself here if I have a final cough or two on that cold. Anyway, let's get going here. Our topic is uh, exercise for mood and anxiety disorders. I want to note uh, important collaborators. I work regularly with uh, Jasper Smith and also Michael Bolinsky on projects ranging from exercise for anxiety and mood to exercise for treatment of substance dependence to use of exercise to promote cognition. And I'll mention a couple of those as I go through here today. Um, conflict of interest. Uh, last few years, I've consulted for a number of uh, industry companies, uh, although they have no relation to our topic tonight. Um, I do have book royalties. Uh, we, the start of this area for me came with a graduate student years ago asking about how well exercise works for depression. That's the first question. I thought, well, uh, you know, I hear it does, but we should take a look. And the more we looked, the more amazed I became at the strength of this intervention. And we started with uh, meta-analyses, trying to pull together the evidence for that strength, and then we branched out to other studies. 
So I've been a relatively late convert, but having been a convert to the power of this intervention, we did what uh, we academics do, which is write books about it. And we started first with some treatment manuals for clinicians. And by the way, if you're, if you're eager to write some books that not many people will read, go for the treatment manuals for clinicians. That's guaranteed to buy at least one pair of shoes for your kids um, over three years or so. Uh, but we also decided that uh, given the usual sales of those books, we should go direct to consumer. And the important shift in writing direct to consumer is that we had to address within the book motivational issues, and that's reflected in the talk. That I'm going to talk first, talk in three parts. First part, evidence for the effects of exercise on mood and anxiety disorder. A little bit uh, trying to address the question, why does it work? But then finally, the largest part of the talk is motivation. And I can stretch this talk into about three hours, but you folks will get about 40 minutes from this point. And so time is going to move fast because I really do want to get to the motivational issues that tend to be so important. Okay, um, I also want to mention that we have a blog on the topic, so uh, for patients, this gives uh, additional glimpses at some of the evidence and some of the practical things going on that, that psychology today. We also have an exercise for mood blog with uh, some of the monitoring sheets that we find useful. All right, let's start with the question why. What is the evidence that prescribing exercise for mood and anxiety might be viable? And that evidence starts with these very large correlational studies that people who exercise have less depression, less anxiety, less anger, less cynical distrust. And you can imagine that if you have all those things, you have better social integration. But, of course, some of you are thinking, well, that's... That's nice. That's correlational. Uh, could it be that if you feel better, you exercise, or is it that if you exercise, you feel better? And besides, these are just symptoms. What about disorders? So let's go first to disorders. You see the same pattern across uh, anxiety and mood disorders. People who are active and are exercising have lower rates of disorder. But again, it's correlational. Let's go to more experimental evidence. What happens if you randomize people? or depressed or anxious to exercise or not. Well, uh, this is where we start in the literature. That we start with a meta-analysis now way back in 2006. At that point, there were 11 nicely controlled randomized clinical trials uh, that people exercise or, and they had a control group. There was often no treatment, but sometimes was stretching, which is a real nice control group, right? It, it has mind-body aspects. Uh, has attention to the body, doing something with the body, but it's just not exercise, and so it's a really good control group. The frequency varied greatly. A lot of the studies that you're going to see in my presentation target about four times a week, often around 40 minutes each time, and are moderate in exercise. Uh, you know, a nice target for moderate exercise is about 70 to 75 uh, percent of the maximum heart rate. That's what most of these studies are. Let me get ready for a question. Someone's going to ask, is this the optimal exercise? And I'll tell you now, we don't know. The field often uses aerobic exercise. So we know that's where our greatest evidence is that that works. Walking and running, bike riding are used in an awful lot of studies. But some studies use some different things, sometimes more strenuous yoga, sometimes throwing in some weightlifting. Those studies look like they work as well. But there's just not enough evidence to say, well, what you should really do is this exercise versus that or more aerobic versus weight-bearing. Don't have the answer yet to that question. So I'm going to talk about exercise in general. But most of our studies, aerobic exercise, about 40 minutes, four times a week. Anyway, doing that for depression gives you an absolutely whopping controlled effect size. It really beats a controlled condition. And as a cognitive behavior therapist, I looked at this and thought, oh, my gosh, this really rivals what we do in cognitive behavior therapy. It rivals what happens with medication. This deserves additional attention. Now, this is the broadest view you can get. Let's look at an individual study, uh, exercise, run off against search lane, some different conditions. Supervised exercise, that's nice because you know the patients in the trial do it. At home exercise, often there's less adherence than there was in this trial. Or um, sertraline drug, an SSRI, or pill placebo. 16 weeks, look at that, three 45-minute sessions. They use vigorous intensity exercise. A lot of the other studies are moderate. 
And um, what do we get? We get that the supervised exercise really looks good, home base a little bit less, probably because of the drop in adherence to regular exercise. Uh, certainly also did well, all, uh, all doing better than placebo. So we see in the individual trial really good evidence that it works. But what if these are the easy cases, right? What if people are just signing up to go into a trial and are willing to be randomized exercise because their depression is less severe? Well, I like this next trial because they're not the easy cases. Oops, I'm sorry. I'll get to that in a second. A little bit of a dose-response relationship, which is exactly what you want to do if truly doing any exercise is what's operative in helping people get better. Here's my, the one I was coming to, treatment-resistant depression, small trial, just 33 patients, but these 33 individuals failed two adequate antidepressant trials. Uh, they got randomized to either exercise and continue on their medication or to not just continue in the medication alone. That's the control group. Here's that dose, uh, 30, 40 minutes. They're here five times a week, 12-week trial, and no change in the stress control group. They got 10 out of 19 to either respond or to remit. So even though people don't respond to an alternative treatment, in this case, adequate pharmacotherapy trials, exercise can offer something viable. All right, let's step over to anxiety. I got to tell you, most of these trials are not with my patients, which means they're not trials of people coming to a specialty anxiety clinic um, for, in my case, cognitive therapy. Uh, these are often trials, except for three, of people who are stressed or anxious for other reasons. Uh, some trials were hospital-based, getting a diagnosis, having a sick relative. And so it's part of the intervention of lower-level anxiety and stress. But the bottom line is that it works uh, really nicely for that. There's a growing number of anxiety trials that support the idea that can do well for anxiety conditions. And here's a close look. This is a trial of panic disorder. And um, if you look down at the line, the bottom line is that it was a little bit slower onset, but exercise did nicely for many of the outcomes. All right, deep breaths. Why? Why might exercise work? Well, there's lots of reasons, and the slides coming out mainly just say that. There's all sorts of reasons why exercise might work. Um, it does lead to neuromodulation of both serotonin and noradrenergic systems. Um, as SSRIs do, for example, for the serotonergic system. So it could have a direct effect um, with those neurotransmitters. Also, you know, across, across the decades, we've seen the theories of why antidepressants work change. Uh, you know, kind of early dopamine interest, then noradrenergic interest, and then sort of serotonergic interest, and then maybe a mixed serotonergic noradrenergic theory. And now the latest theory, as you all know, is well, maybe it works by enhancement of brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF, uh, that helps uh, that's neurotrophin. It protects neural functioning. It aids learning and memory. We'll come back to this point. But let me tell you about one study in particular. This used older adults, not so old. It's older, ages 55 to 80. They were randomized. Uh, to exercise or stretch and control, uh, 40 minutes of walking, moderate exercise three times a week, and this study goes on for a year. It's a really nice long-term um, trial. What this trial found is that that exercise enhanced BDNF functioning. The other thing that happens in this age range is that the hippocampus, which aids your memory, of course, helps you kind of get to memories, is shrinking about 1% a year in this age range. And what they found is that, indeed, they saw hippocampal volume shrinkage in the control group, but they saw a growth of 1% in the exercise group. So it, it, it induces BDNF, and we see some uh, BDNF-related expected changes, protection of neural functioning, and um, better cognitive function correlated with um, BDNF change. Let's do some more on this topic. We got so interested with this that uh, my group did a uh, meta-analysis looking at how reliable the effect is between exercise and BDNF responses. We found 30 studies that provided this. Here's the answer. 
Uh, well, you see the answer over in the corner. First of all, you see that I have a little miracle Grow icon, and that's the way I think in BDNF. This is a squirt, a miracle Grow for your brain. And again, uh, both enhancing long-term potentiation, um, the, you know, the, the best-known cellular neuronal uh, transcription of information and memories, and uh, supportive function neurons more generally. Here's what it looks like. A moderate single bout of exercise leads to a brief beat in F response. So if you think of this miracle grow, you water the plant with each exercise bout with a little bit of BDNF. Now, if you do regular exercise, it looks like the brain gets more efficient and you get an enhanced watering with each bout of exercise. Also, there was change to resting levels, but there was a, mu a smaller effect size, about half of the other effect sizes, which means the, you know, the, the, the resting levels, you get a small change, but also a larger change is this regular exercise. Really good for your brain. Now, I just want to say that we've now been interested enough in these results that we are starting to combine exercise with cognitive rehab techniques that are used, for example, in serious mental illness, schizophrenia, for example, to see if with brain training we can add some you know, miracle growth at the time of that training to get a better result. All right. But let me take you back. I really am on the focus of why, though. So it might be this neuromodulation, might be BDNF. It also has some nice effects on buffering stress, and we know stress seems to potentiate depression, retard recovery from depression, and certainly has a role in the anxiety disorders. And just a quick slide, the same with a couple of different measures, we see less stress reactivity with people who are, in, are better trained or in better shape. Um, a few other things, we see GABA modulation, uh, the, the action of the benzodiazepines. Um, uh, we see direct modulation with exercise. We see the ANP, which inhibits HPA axis. So a lot of neuronal-based systems. Also, psychological mechanisms. We know that regular exercise helps people tolerate negative distressing sensations. And everybody who runs knows this, right? But regular running, you get exposed to rapid heart rate uh, challenges breathing, challenges of catching your breath, sometimes the stomach ache, leg pain, all sorts of sensations, and you learn to ignore them. There are disorders with that ability to accept some of the sensations having to do with arousal are very, very useful, and it's certainly true in a panic disorder and should be also true in PTSD, and it, our research says it certainly does that research with uh, Jasper Smith. Uh, reduces anxiety sensitivity with regular exercise. Also, the very idea of getting out and exercising when you feel bad is counter to what depression is telling you, which is you can think of depression as a message of pull in. It doesn't matter. Conserve your resources because it won't go, won't go well anyway. Or anxiety. Uh oh, avoid. Something bad may happen. And in the face of that, you're not in inhibiting or avoiding. You're getting out and doing. And that may have an, uh, these sort of uh, effects of countering the action tendencies of the disorder, may help undo the disorder. And in essence, exercise is behavioral activation, which a variety of research has shown is very powerful in the treatment of depression. All right. A lot of reasons why it might work. We don't know which one of is true or whether they're all true. Really good, but. You all know some of these data. These are percent of Americans with no leisure time physical activity. This is government. There's government data at work. And depending on whether you're optimist or pessimist, you can see an absolutely straight line. Or if you're an optimist, it gets a little bit better. But across these 20 years, we don't see very many substantial changes in the number of people are doing nothing for regular exercise. And this is across the time period of what? Jazzercise, and Kaibo, and uh, Roomba, or Zumba. One of those is the vacuum crater, one of them is one of those, the dance craze. But pretty rock solid, which says to me that these crazes as they come around, they're not getting new people to exercise, they're just getting people who are already exercised to go then do the next latest thing. A lot of adults, you know, their BC rates are high, are just not exercising. So now we get to the question. How do we get people to exercise? So now I get to talk about motivation. Now, if we're going to talk about motivation, I have to ask, motivation for what? Motivation for the outcome? I want to look 
buffed at the beach next year. A lot of people have that motivation. But not the same motivation which you have to go to to get there. And especially when you think about having motivation for changing shape, changing weight, changing blood pressure. You've got to exercise a really long time to get those health outcomes. Exercising for fitness is a really bad contingency. Effort multiple times a week and outcomes months down the road. Not what you want if you want people to persist. But here's the good news, really good news. The mood effects are much more immediate. Now, these are not the full response, right? Remember that these treatment trials looked across 12 weeks. There's time for people to get there. You saw this curve of reduce anxiety and panic happening across those 12 weeks, for example. It takes a while to get there for resolution of disorder, but with each bout of exercise, you can be reasonably sure, depending on a few things we'll talk about in a while, that you can feel a fairly immediate mood boost. Here's some of the data coming up on that. Uh, reductions in depression, tension, anger, distress. And you can see that they start five minutes after. Some of them grow over 30 minutes to the next hour. And I gotta tell you, you can slow these down. So you don't see them at 30 minutes. You just start seeing them at 30 minutes if you exercise really, really hard. The more intense the exercise, the more you have kind of recovery that will slow your ability to notice and appreciate these effects. So we're going to prescribe, as I might as well say now, moderate intensity exercise. There's lots of reasons to pursue it. And it looks like for the health gain, and, um, and the mood gains, moderate intensity anxiety gets you most of the way there. And you avoid some of the negative aspects of exercise. We'll get to those in a bit. But let's talk more generally about motivation and a few of the cultural ideas on motivation. And you hear that if you listen to people. Hey, Michael, do you want to go, do you want to go running this afternoon? Uh, let me check. Yeah, let me uh, look inward. No, oh, I wish I did, but I'm just not full enough on motivation. Or, you know, as we get in a couple hours, I'm hoping to feel more motivated. Or this idea of digging deep, sir, i got to get motivated somehow. That's how people talk about it, and that's not how I want to talk about motivation. That sort of effortful push to get motivated. I'm going to talk about making motivation easier. In fact, most people are really motivated. They're motivated to watch TV, they're motivated to chat with a friend, they're motivated to play a game, here's a person after work, and he has the motivation to work out. It's just under a lot of these other motivations. Part of the job of motivation is simply to resort motivation, get the, the one you want to do on top. And to do that, I want you to keep in mind that there's a variety of evidence suggesting that you're effort, your push to do something is like a muscle and it tires across the day. So if I think, oh, I better, well, look at those fantastic fries at lunch. No, I don't want to have the fries at lunch. Self-control effort. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to get a salad instead. Oh, I should go talk to my colleague about that. You know, I don't, oh, yeah, I'll make myself go do self-control effort. Get home, I want to be, I'll pay a few bills. Okay, I'll make myself do that. Okay, now I want to go running. No push effort left. So instead of kind of relying on that sort of self-control effortful push, what else can we do? Well, one is use environment to manipulate the hierarchy of motivation. And using mini efforts. By the way, my, I, I've been talking about mini efforts with, uh, with my students in supervision, and they love this in depression for any assignment they give. Let me tell you about it. Got to get this guy off the couch. To get him off the couch to go out running, a monumental effort, right? Don't do that. We want to look at what's the smallest effort to get this person to a different environment where the environment can better support exercise. So what's the first thing? Well, oh, I don't like wearing my work clothes. Let me just change into my running clothes. Now, as soon as I change into my exercise clothes, I'm more of an athlete, right? I have all these cues where I look at what I'm wearing. I'm an athlete now instead of a work guy. And as an athlete, I naturally feel a little bit more like working out, but still, I don't know. Well, let me just go outside. Let me just get outside the front door. That's all I need to do. So I go outside the front door. I think, all right, I made that. Well, what should I do? Well, let me just walk a little bit. 
So I started walking, not a hard shift between standing outside the front door and walking out the front door. And once I'm walking, I think, well, let me just run a little bit. See, each little motivational step is small, and what precedes it is a motivational state, environmental state, that better holds the motivation. That's chaining the small efforts together. All right, let me also talk about mixing motivation. Let me tell you about a real problem. It happens in every hotel you all visit to go to a conference. It happens in uh, your, your businesses, academic institutions, et cetera. What I'm really talking about is the problem of male spillage in the restrooms. This is men not aiming well at the year and own companies that sell products. We'll talk a lot about this. It costs a lot of money to clean up such spillage. Now, what can I do about it? How can I motivate men not to do, do this? If, I, if I'm a head of the custodial staff, I'm going to save time and effort, make my bathroom smell better. What do I do? Well, I can put up a sign that says, aim well. In fact, if I'd be really honest, I'd say, aim well, please, Michael, or aim well, the management. Well, whose motivation is that? That's the management work. We're asking, go, here's a prescription, aim better, guys. That's not going to work so well. And plus, people are looking in the wrong direction if they're looking up in my sign for reducing spillage, at least. So what else might I do? Well, a company did this. And if you look at the slides, etched on the porcelain is a little fly, a shape of a fly. And if you put that in the toilet, you know what men do naturally? They aim at it. In fact, they aim at it and they kind of go, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so we're combining motivation, creating a natural motivation to aim well in the company that makes these uh, reports about uh, spillage was reduced by 85% because we induce people. Now, nice toilet story, Michael, but what does this have to do with our topic? Well, how else can we mix motivation? Now, a lot of my examples, by the way, about running because I don't like running that much, but I do it because it's an efficient exercise. So I'm always thinking, how can I make it better? So how can I manipulate my environment to better support exercise? Well, let me tell you, personally, you know, to academic, I've got to write. I've got to write all the darn time. And I can listen to music while I write, but the one thing I can't do while I write is read books. I miss reading novels. So I finally happened on the idea that I got to switch to audio back, folks. I'm going to listen to them during my commute in to work. So if I drive in, for example, I listen the whole way. But then I found out, oh my gosh, I'd sit in the parking structure trying to get to a chapter. So I was listening to um, woman, the trilogy, starting with Woman with the Dragon Tattoo, and those would trap me where I was sitting, right? So I thought, this isn't working. I'm still being inefficient. I finally had the bright idea of just listening to that book while I was exercising. I looked forward to getting back to the book. All I had to do, self-control, is keep, and I, and I bought CDs, so I was playing it on my old, seriously, my old red Walkman CD player. Playing on that, and all I had to do is keep that in my exercise gym. That was the only self-control. I'd look forward to it, and I'd want to read, and I'd just have to go out and run during that. And I would run a long time. Stupidly so, I might add, because you had to hold that old Walkman level, so I had to hold it level while I was running along. But otherwise, it was a magnificent idea. Um, oh, let me say, there's um, years after this went into the book, for example, uh, there was a study of this where they, they used MP3 players at a gym, and they gave out books. You could rent the MP3 player for free in the study while you were at the gym, and listen to a book, and they, they double gym attendance by getting people hooked on books, and they had to come back to the gym to uh, get the next episode. So we know it really does work to help get people to exercise. Oh, look at that nice couple. Look at that nice couple. Um, you know, I could look at that couple and think, oh, my gosh, running with his partner out there, that'd be great. I should do that, especially on the beach. That'd be wonderful. That's one take. And it really is goal contagion, right? You've heard this, that. Uh, gaining weight seems to travel through social network. Depression travels through social network. And exercise can also travel through social network with support. And other people setting the standard for how much to work out. I'll come back to this, but my wife is very athletic, and her friends are very athletic. And I thought I was in pretty good shape until I met her and met her friends. And then to up my game, just try to get closer to the norm. There's goal contagion. But that's not the only thing I may say, which is, oh, gosh, they're doing it. Let me do it, too. I may also say, you know, uh, 
gosh, I don't look so, I can't, I don't look so good in that shirt. I don't look so good in that pants, which means we can coach ourselves out of some of the natural things that would support exercise. Um, this can take a lot of time. I'm going to give you this short thing. With any good cognitive restriction, pre-identify maladaptive thoughts, things that may derail motivation, write them down, present them to people, rehearse countering strategies, what are you going to do, what are you going to say to yourself when these thoughts come up, and then do it. And so in the book and elsewhere, we've generated a lot of these. What do people often say in the morning? And uh, what, what might be an alternative thought? And we have these in the morning example, the example, the midday run exercise example, and the evening examples, different sets of thoughts to get people so they cannot be pushed off their goals by these sorts of negative thoughts. Oh, my gosh, everything I said so far was pre-exercise. But, of course, motivation, and a good be a therapist knows, isn't just what you do before, it's what you do during and what you do after, because post-exercise is the next pre-exercise. So let me get to the rest of these other ways to intervene with motivation. Here's what everybody thinks. Well, feeling bad during exercise predict how much people exercise in the future. You don't you have negative affect, you exercise less down the road. And this predicted six months and a year down the road. Really good prediction. So what should we do? Keep people from feeling bad during exercise. Well, oh, and uh, it's my wife, isn't it? How do you like that photo? Can't recognize it. I don't know you people, these people. So uh, can't, I say that every talking when I know the people. Um, what about this picture? I was trying to get a picture of her and actually gone out running and I said, so, um, you know, show me really exhausted after, you know, like, really exercise too hard. Show me that. Click. Uh, that's not it. Try to get into this. Click. That's not it. Try to get into ten. Finally, I said, look, look, just look like I look after exercise. And then we got a really good picture. So really high intensity explains feeling bad. Let me just say the effect is earlier for people who are overweight and obese. But once you get past the ventilatory threshold, um, which is, if we're running, it's a point in which I really have, have trouble talking to you while we exercise because I can't catch my breath. That level is usually where bad feelings starts going in. That's often the shifting point between moderate exercise and vigorous exercise. And guess what? Moderate exercise below the ventilatory threshold is good enough to get some really nice mood shifts. So one thing people can target is exercise that does not feel as bad. And you have some evidence they tend to exercise more when they do that. Also, there's a couple of factors that push people away from exercise. One is anxiety sensitivity, uh, prominent in panic disorder, PTSD, uh, moderately elevated in the rest of the anxiety disorders and depression. This sense of fear of rapid heartbeat, fear of numbness and tingling, heavy sensations, uh, fear of sensations arousal because of the belief they're, they're bad for you. And in multiple studies, we've shown that anxiety sensitivity is correlated with um, either, depends on how we did in the study, but all these uh, less exercise, less vigorous exercise, uh, more bad feeling, fear during exercise. And we know anxiety sensitivity with some cognitive restructuring and a little bit of exposure is pretty treatable. The other factor is social physical anxiety, lower part of this. One way we can think of that is traveling over to someone else's head and saying, oh, my God, look at that guy, Michael. Look, he's sweating when he shouldn't be. Why is that weight so hard? Why is he sweating so much on the treadmill? It's like social phobia about how you look when you're exercising. Boy, you have a high SPA score social physique anxiety, you know, really hate working out in gyms with mirrors, things like that. And so helping people coach themselves better, stay out of other people's heads when they're working out, can help make uh, exercise environment better, working out with friends, not in a gym, et cetera, can also help with that. Um, I just want to say, yeah, if we do that, we've got to keep in mind where the culture is going. Look at these headlines, hard muscles fast, Amazing abs in just 28 days, and this other guy, he's going to get fit by summer. This idea that fitness happens fast, and in fact, let me tell you, the evidence of the most optimal workouts for fat-burning, muscle-building, cardiovascular change, including cardiovascular risk reduction, if it doesn't kill you, by the way, is 
kidney is very hard workout. It would be, in essence, a sprint for a minute, light run, sprint for a minute, light run, sprint for a minute, light run, alternating minutes. And that's one of these great 10-minute workouts using high-intensity intervals. It is true that it's very good for your body if you work up and don't overly stress and watch out for injury. It's also true that every time I try that workout, I go through tubular rosses, stages of dying, and I never get to acceptance because that, then I get a break and I have to do it again, right? It, this is a versatile workout. So we've had Patty Eckert-Hawkers writes about this, exercise physiologist, that um, one of these magazines and research in general sort of treat you like your muscles on a stick, optimizing the muscle workout. We're not considering about how versatile it is. In everything we do, we're, we're recommending moderate exercise unless you really like the vigorous stuff to stay away from this high aversive. And there's more. Um, what do you pay attention to run? You know, sometimes if I run, I'll be thinking 38, 39, 40, and I think, what am I counting? And I realize I'm counting my breath. That is boring. I may be thinking about my left knee, which is even more boring, right? Part of what happens, um, part of what can be done during exercise is guiding people's attention to things that makes exercise more fun, attending to colors, attending to their breeze, having a good music, having a good book, to have something to look forward to in the middle of the experience. Plus two other things. A brief study, um, have people put their hand in cold water, ow, that hurts for two minutes, turn colored tub, another tub of water, you also have to put your hand in later. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, also in your hand for two minutes, and then you have to leave your hand in longer. But during that little bit longer time, they warm the water slightly to give you a better finish. Then they say, hey, which tub of water would you rather put your hand in? And people tend to pick the tub, pick more often the tub, that was warmed at the end because of the better finish. Well, let's use that with exercise, which means if you're really dogmatic, you're near the end of your work on this one of those, uh, 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 um, slow down, catch your breath, and give yourself a nice finish so you can remember that. Also, it turns out that people don't often uh, picture exercise all the way through. Hey, Michael, when I work out, you think of the start of it, which is often the most impressive part. If you have people think through What's at the beginning, what's in the middle, what's at the end, how they want to finish, how they feel afterwards. They get a much more accurate picture and are much more motivated to work out with that fuller picture of exercise. And play, oh my gosh, making exercise social, making it fun. Here's, something, here's a zombie run. Right? If you've got to run, you want to do a zombie run. Um, those are hard zombies. You can actually sign up, pay your money to either be a zombie or a runner, and you see that woman there, or that guy gets his uh, woman has one flag, he has two flags on it. If they rip off your flags, you lose your lives. You don't get a, you don't get a time. Um, but, and by the way, they, they've evolved. You, of course, know the evolution that zombies used to always be slow. Now they're fast in some of the movies, and they have fast and chase zombies as well as the slow ones. So even if you can run, there's ways of having events that make training and anticipation of the event more fun. Post-exercise. Wow, I did it. That was kind of hard, but boy, now do I feel I feel good now. That simple coaching, we want people to be able to do. Absolutely, we want them to be able to do it. Because any coaching like that is good for anything, right? This is a skill we want every person to have, to commend themselves for on-track goal behavior. And as you know, many people are really bad at that. And so uh, this is attention for clinicians who may want to prescribe exercises while people are prescribing to themselves. We want you to be a good, positive coach. In fact, I believe in echoing. If you think about what you did perhaps on your drive home or commute home today, what you did at every stoplight, often you were thinking about the worst moment of your day. I'm ruminating about that worst moment, which means you relive it over and over again, like an echo, bad, 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 bad. 
Instead, what I'd like you to do at stoplights is try to echo the best moment of your day. Think about that. And we want you to echo exercise. Hey, oh my, how my legs feel? I gave myself a good workout. Wow, I really hit my goals for this week. That's fantastic. To go back over it, again, to set in memories about your success, which is part of the motivation that you need next time you go out there. And, like any good behavior therapist, say, force me. And the behavior therapy cabal to have this slide to say, of course, track it. So you can notice that, indeed, mood goes up. Uh, what happens with aversive thoughts, um, both before and after exercise, and see, you know, here's a nice uh, post of processing, seeing this difference, um, what I'll make of it. These are the sort of forms you might find on an exercise for a mood website, if you're interested in the book as well. Um, and doing all that will create the cycle of motivation. I teach a motivation course, probably because I wrote this book. I had to learn it and then I started teaching it. Uh, motivation is this full cycle. It's not what you do before. It's what you do before, during, and afterward to create a cycle of having it much more easy and creating that wonderful, wonderful thing called habit when you start exercising more automatically. And also getting really good at the barriers. Where do you put your gym clothes? Do not make yourself look for your last tennis shoe. That looking for the last tennis shoe will derail your efforts. Keep it up by the door. Keep it in the car. You want every step to go completion to start easily so you don't get derailed. What about the actual prescription? Look, this is, this is American Heart Association, ACSM, American, American College of Sports Medicine. And, and these differ a little bit, and they change by the year. But the bottom line is we like the top one. We tend to go with moderate intensity of rugby exercise, uh, aiming for these several episodes, four or five, 40 minutes. That's what we tend to do most often, but breaking it up. In fact, one study with the best feed and effort response had people weightlifting one day a week while uh, doing aerobic stuff the other time, and you don't get bored. And again, I mentioned what running ugh. I love, just give person for a second, I love rock climbing. Not outdoor rock climbing with actual elements and rough rocks. Indoor rock climbing with good music, air conditioning, padding, and really nice ropes. I love that. And I don't think about my workouts. I promise, oh, what did I miss? I can get my leg there. And I get this fantastic workout without any self-control effort, especially if I go with the body. I don't want to call it the wall. I better go with the body makes it very easy to show up. And so that's using social and play and lots of distraction during it because it's so interesting, it's problem solving, to make exercise easy. Now, uh, for those of you that are providers and are thinking about, hmm, maybe I'll prescribe this. And by the way, the evidence is uh, not many studies of this kind, but one study offering group cognitive behavior therapy just had people stay after group and prescribe exercise and that adds to the efficacy of CBT for anxiety disorders. So there's uh, every reason to add this to both pharmacologic care and uh, psychosocial care. Um, the American College of Sports Medicine, ACSM, gives you some stratification that if people are low risk or moderate risk, um, you might be okay to go ahead and prescribe exercise, but you want to get a physician's referral for exercise so they make some high risk. Bottom line, I always give physicians permission, being a psychologist, for exercise when I prescribe it. It's part of what I evaluate um, in the intake interview. Uh, it's part of what I track when I do. It's, and that way I never need to be a major focus. But I can get in this additional intervention that um, does have some side effects, right? Maybe some soreness if people start out too much, maybe a broken ankle here or there but also has a side effect, meaning that the targeted effect of better mood is that you're likely to live much longer, you're likely to have better cognition. I didn't show the slide, but you're also uh, evidence that men likely to have better sex, uh, higher ratings of sexual functioning and pleasure with regular exercisers, all sorts of great reasons, in addition to the benefits of her mood and anxiety both at uh, dimensional mood and anxiety as well as disorder mood and anxiety. And as always, working with people to help them find the activity that they find most interesting, most playful, 
and the easiest to arrange without barriers in their schedule. That said, I'm ready to take some questions. And that means you've got to type. And so uh, type those in if you have them. Yes, at this point, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A pod. And this is one of those awkward moments where you think, was anybody out there? I see 49 names, but I don't know if they're really there. At least say hi so we know the Q&A is working. <laughs> yes, we have a bunch of people saying hi, so it is working. Um, Dr. Otto, there's one question there. If you click on the participant view, you're going to be able to see the first one. Okay, there we go. Oh, hello, all you people, Michael, Anita, Noel, and Aram. Yes. And okay, okay. So the, um, the fine. So l let me lead up to this. So we're we're back on the BDNF findings that a, lot, a couple of meta analysis. I think it's three now. Two with adult, one with kids. Say that exercise improves cognition. And that includes both memory attention most prominently as well as a few other functions. And um, the imagers doing studies will look and say that we get this effect in the elderly on hippocampal uh, volume, which is how big your hippocampus is, crucial part of your forming new memories, getting to memories, shrinks with age uh, very slowly, and it seems to increase it, and there's some good evidence that the the reason why exercise does that is because of the enhancement of the miracle grow, that's the way I refer to it, of BDNF. And so, um, the, so to say it's simply to reverse hippocampal shrinkage, regular exercise appears to help. Only one study in that, but that I know uh, that has done really well, lots of studies that says exercise gives you enhanced BDNF functioning and uh, improves cognition. All right, I'm looking at, um, oh, what was the name of the blog? So I mentioned two blogs. Uh, the blog is at, psychology, if you go to Psychology Today, Mood and Anxiety, uh, um, you should get to it, or Psychology Today blog, Michael Otto, uh, uh, Jasper Smith and I. I don't know how many we have up there, but nice way to get an additional chat about some of these uh, topics that went through today. Um, Exercise use with children and adolescents, it looks like uh, certainly the cognitive benefits go there as well. And there's a few studies of mood benefits as well with adolescents. Uh, and again, using play first as the target. Anybody works with kids and does exercise, says, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, let's face it, in the adolescent years, you, you guys don't feel the effect of this. The coach using running as a punishment. Is that not the worst idea ever for trying to induce lifelong exercise, especially with something that's easy to arrange as running? So, especially if they're in the years where coaches still going to use it as a punishment, finding any sort of aerobic exercise or other exercise, including dance, that is not running might be a good idea with the young folks. Um, oh, sometimes when I finish from okay. exercise, I feel anxious. Couple things. Um, you know, making sure that you're not low on calories. Um, the, there's some animal studies that show a little bit more anxiety after sustained training and lower calories uh, when the uh, animals are kept on lower calories. Uh, that'd be one thing to look for. Make sure you have and that you're not low on salt either. Um, other than that, um, some. Sometimes people get trembly after exercise. We want to make sure that that, that uh, symptom is not being confounded with being actually anxious. And aim for moderate. The only study that I know that really documented increased anxiety were ones that had rats running, like, seriously, 14 miles, I think it was, a night, um, or those that are done under low calories. So I would think of watching out for each of those things. Uh, how often do you recommend or use exercise as monotherapy? You know, um, the, uh, I guess with the book we're aiming for, uh, the book by an audience to do that, given what I do, uh, people are coming to me for cognitive therapy, so I'm offering that first. And 
adding it to me. And I'm just not known in the community enough as that motto exercise guy. So um, do patients buy it? There's, I love that part of the question because there's, there's exercise haters out there, right? They've been hating exercise ever since, or uh, from all these horrible developmental challenges, ever since coach made them run laps, ever since they picked laps to the basketball team, ever since they dropped the ball in the important game, right? And in fact, there was a study um, that came out of the British Journal of Medicine, British Journal of Psychiatry, and BJM, I think it was, that uh, did not find benefit for exercise with a large cohort of people who are depressed going to primary care. And you should have seen the headlines, like, exercise doesn't work. You can almost hear the cheering in the headlines that exercise doesn't work for depression. The truth of the trial that was really clear there is that there's only a 9% difference in exercise rates between the exercise group and the non-exercise group. Think about that in the antidepressant trial. Uh, like 40 Forty-two percent of the people were taking antidepressant in the placebo group, and fifty-one were taking it in the uh, active treatment group. You'd expect that wouldn't be significant, but the headlines I think reflected how different, how much people don't like to exercise. In fact, those of you who go to the the blog, you'll find some people writing in there about how dare you say this? I hate exercise; it makes me feel bad. So, like any treatment, SSRIs versus CBT versus some other therapy, you can get lovers and haters of that. What I'm satisfied with is at least getting this into consideration as a choice of intervention. Uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, idea of chaining. Uh, questions that were explained it again. Using the environment to enhance motivation. Part of what the environment does is can resort your motivation. So if I talk about how nice it would be to travel to the Caribbean and spend some time on a warm beach, um, some of you may start upping that goal in your hierarchy of goals, and if so, you may even act on it, right? So part of, you know, not trying to say, I need to go run five miles as a goal. The goal is saying, just let me change my clothes into my exercise clothes and let the feel of being in your exercise clothes lead you to feel more motivated to exercise. But let me just get outside. Let me just walk. A series of individual goals that change your context so it's easy to do the next goal. Um, in supervision, I mentioned uh, supervision with my uh, graduate students, the case the other day with some uh, depressed persons lambasting themselves for not getting to some task, and we looked at what was the smallest step in that direction that may make it seem easier to do that, you know, like not sitting on the couch, not turning on the television. The first step is just turn off the television put yourself in a position where it might be easier to follow through with the next goal. That's what I meant by that chain. Um, indoors and outdoors, um, there was one study that had difficulty finding again, a study that looked at BDNF response where it had people run either next to a highway or in a, um, in a nice park and had a better BDNF response in the park. Certainly those factors that can reduce the pleasure of exercise there are some hotels I've exercised. You know, I try never to exercise in a hotel exercise facility because it's so much more fun seeing the sights of the city if I'm traveling. So you have those non-specific benefits, but it's also cold and in certain neighborhoods dangerous. And so it is always consider the context and aim for the one that's more fun. It, you know, exercising watching TV is great if you can set that up because you're using your exercise time as your TV time. Uh, how does um, oh overweight overweight how does an overweight person with sore feet start to exercise uh, and and we get we get to that natural thing of uh, swimming ideal for some of those conditions I don't swim I don't like small pools um, you know there are I gotta say there are pools that now use bromine instead of chlorine oh my gosh it smells so much better so you might be able to get around that one with the right pool. Um, um, Starting slow, looking for any sort of movement, seated exercise, seated bikes, reading while you do it, upping the, the uh, distraction, finding a good TV show, doing it during a movie. There's um, exercise machines um, that work well that you can actually put in front of the couch uh, that don't have you pushing hard straight down. I've got a bunch of products endorsement here. 
but um, yeah, you got to hunt the web a bit to find those. Uh, but yeah, you're looking for anything that that um, looks good. Arm exercises, and nothing says it has to be with your legs. Those are big muscles. But looking for exercise with other muscle groups. Um, the exercise certainly has similar effects. Uh, has there been exercise looking at the combination? The only good one I know was that one that looked at treatment refractory where they add exercises the next add-on condition showed value for that. Starting people out, giving them both at the same time. Oh, gosh, I'm trying to remember if there was a trial by uh, Maduka Trevetti who did that. I can't quite remember or not. Um, so I have about five minutes left. Let's see how far I can go with these questions. Mild asthma, oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, so a couple of things. You know, people with asthma often will may be given albuterol uh, to uh, retard asthma during exercise. You have likely to have an asthma attack. This person has asthma and anxiety. Albuterol gives you the trembles. How do I know? I have it. Um, and that can, um, then the tremble, if you don't know what it is, can be very frightening and may feel like the start of a panic attack. So. Just want you to be careful of that, uh, being able to attribute symptoms to that. Um, yeah, similarity of symptoms of both. Uh, uh, trying to think how to say this efficiently. Uh, we have used exercise to reduce other fears, in part by using exercise the same area. We're going to do a specific exercise to induce specific symptoms. This is interceptive exposure for cognitive behavior therapy to help people get comfortable with them. And so I would break it down into smaller elements and protect. the key is to practice doing nothing in response to symptoms, even paying attention to them and dropping your shoulders to not give them special status. That's a, that was a short answer to a longer question. A good cognitive therapist does panic disorder should be really, really good. Anybody, any therapist that does interceptive exposure can really target that issue. Uh, oh, okay, the exercise at night and after dinner. So here's good news. Boy, boy the, um, I did Red Cross way back when. When was my Red Cross course? In the early 70s. And they still have the books, whatever you do, don't exercise uh, after, don't swim after eating. You know, whether you cramp depends on how good you are at exercising after eating. People exercise after eating all the time. Your body can adapt to it. You don't want to eat and go to swim for the first time, but adapt to it. When should you exercise? The answer is whenever you feel like it. Here's the only finding I could ever find about timing. If you have to compete and want to eat really well at a certain time of day, you should train at that time of day. So, for example, well, timing-wise, I was running in the evening, and I want to go do that 5K and do better. All those 5Ks start at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock, most of them. My performance could be worse because my body is not used to that time frame for exercising. So matching it can help subtly with more higher-end performance. Otherwise, it just doesn't matter. Um, the, uh, we, we have a study out there, uh, Xander Credlow is the first author. We looked for interference with sleep given certain types of exercise. We couldn't find it. The idea that exercise a little bit later in the day hurt sleep, we did not find it. Uh, we don't do it right before. Uh, so you do have a lot of freedom. You want to exercise when it's easiest for your schedule, when you have less blocks, when you get blocks to it and get to uh, exercise you need to. Uh, exercise treat substance use disorders. Oh my gosh, there are. So Jasper Smith and Michael Walensky and others finished a trial for smoking um, where it looked like you know, getting a good match between the intervention and uh, what exercise can do for you seems to be important. So there's some early disappointing evidence and one meta-analysis that exercise doesn't help smoking that much. It does look like targeting at people to higher anxiety sensitivity can work better. Those data will be coming out at some point. I realize some sort of pre-publication has been presented once. Um, and uh, boy, it's, there was a CTN NIDA trial that I think exercise did not do well. It was very hard to get certain 
I think it was cocaine abusers, to get the exercise. Um, I don't think what else I know about it. So it, it should work. Uh, often people with regular drug abuse are in lifestyles or even further than some of us have um, for exercise. And so you have perhaps greater barriers to exercise, but it does seem reasonable to um, research it further, but looking for moderators uh, of treatment. Um, we're about to look at exercise and smoking and schizophrenia uh, for the potential via BDNF uh, to schizophrenics who smoke. Oh my gosh, I think I did it. I think I'm out of time. I'm very happy you all logged in. I think I better uh, find out uh, what our moderator says to close this off tonight. Thank you so much, Dr. Otto, for this great presentation. And thanks, everyone, for attending. We hope this was helpful. We did actually get to all of the questions this time. And if you have any other questions, we hope that our website will address um, some of the questions you might have. That's uh, www.edaa.org. Please let friends and family know about this series. And finally, please consider making a contribution to ADAA so we can continue these kinds of programs. So bye for now, and we'll see you next time. Thank you all. You will now be disconnected by the moderator.